Welcome to the second Intergeo talk. The topic today is BIM, Building Information Modeling, digitalization of a huge industry, good prospects for future and society. I'm Denise, I'm your host, together with my colleagues from Team Intergeo, we will lead you into different focus topics until this year's Intergeo event in September hybrid. So, well, building information modeling or consistent information management in planning, construction and existing buildings is an extremely important topic. Digitization in the construction industry is lagging miles behind other industries. And the construction sector is associated with a lack of efficiency and sustainability. But more important, the issue of enorm is of enormous social relevance. If you look at the ecological footprint of the construction industry as a whole, one is shocked by the extent of the waste of resources and the climate impact of the construction industry. A UN environment program called Global Status Report for Buildings and Constructions from 2020 comes to a devastating conclusion. Nearly 40% of global CO2 emissions are associated with the construction sector. 40%. And then there's the issue of waste. In Germany, the construction industry as a large sector of the economy is responsible for half of all waste and recycling of materials is absolutely below average. But from the other side, however, it also means that there is enormous potential for saving energy and materials in this construction sector. So, and there are plenty of opportunities for optimization in terms of efficiency, cost savings and sustainability. So this was my introduction. And um, we say right now, let's talk. We are pleased that we have been able to attract BIM experts and real BIM fans for this Intergeo talk. So our experts for today are Emmanuel Di Giacomo. He works more than 30 years in the architecture, engineering and construction industry. For Autodesk, he is the AEC ecosystem manager for the region Europe, Middle East and Africa. He ensures that the industry is embracing BIM and expanding its ecosystem as, a wide, as widely as possible. He is responsible for the new digital approach to the reconstruction of Paris Notre Dame Cathedral, which was destroyed in 2019. And with us is BIM expert Ilka Mai. With her company LockLab Consulting, she offers digital twins for almost every application. She is a tireless fighter for digital methods in construction and expert on digital twins. For almost two decades, the doctor of geography, GIS and BIM expert has been working with spatial data and technologies. Until 2017, she worked for the international engineering firm Arab in the UK. She led the development of the step-by-step -step plan, digital design and construction, was deputy head of the EU BIM task group and accompanied the BIM strategy of Deutsche Bahn. Our third guest is Ulrich Hartmann. Ulrich Hartmann is working as product manager, common data environment expert and BIM expert in the Oracle Econex strategy team. He is enthusiastic about digital methods for the construction industry since his studies of civil engineering and computer science at the Technical University of Berlin. Various stations in digital fields of product management, research and software development give him a practical background and expertise. As part of the international product strategy team, he fights for innovative digital solutions and the implementation of the BIM strategy in product roadmaps. So first of all, thank you for joining us. And uh, each of the guest starts right now away with a short lecture on impulse. Then there is a round of uh, short interviews. I will have about two or three questions. But what is very important, please ask your questions in the chat at any time. So and right now it starts with Ulrich Hartmann and his impulse to I hope I say it right, uh, right, uh, Ulrich, um, please correct me. Um, I would say 
you say something like BIM is the application to make the construction industry more sustain sustainable. But the stage is right now yours, Ulrich. I hope um, Thank you. it works perfect. Thank you. So welcome everybody. Thank you, Denise, for this nice introduction. Uh, I just want to, of course, also welcome to the audience. I want to start with three BIM statements at the beginning. Um, first statement is BIM is uh, just more, much more than just nice 3D visualizations. It's uh, about the non-visual contents inside our information models. And models are, of course, I would say, uh, made for a purpose. And um, they require information. And these uh, requirements need to be explicitly being specified by those who need this information. Second statement is BIM is about information management that does mean actually we are producing information collaboratively in a distributed way and uh, these pieces of information have to be put together in a managed process with quality checks in between so that everything every information fits together at the end uh, nicely and uh, people can consume those informations uh, in, in according to their purposes so if we look at this nice little picture on the right, we see people sitting together and uh, trying to get uh, to feed themselves, but this fails because they use improper tools. There's lack or losses of um, soup in this case, but if you transfer this metaphor into information management, it's also lack of information. Uh, so um, some people come then to the conclusion it's better to collaborate in a nice way and feed each other, give each other the information they need. So that's kind of a cultural change we also imply with the application of BIM. Um, I found this a nice uh, analogy. Um, and the third point uh, is about integration. BIM is not standing alone. There is a world around us. Um, that does mean we builders of residential commercial industrial buildings and so on, we interfere and interact with systems like energy, supplies, telecoms, with the natural environment, of course, and uh, social infrastructure, transportation systems around us. And uh, as you mentioned, Denise, in the introduction, we produce a lot of waste and we take some resources out of our natural environment, so that's a lot of interference we do in construction. Um, so this word or this uh, upcoming hype, at least uh, about digital twins, is uh, shaping out the interaction between what we do and what the rest of the world is do in terms of digital. So um, this was the three statements at the beginning. Um, how do we at Oracle Equinix live up with our own expectations and visions? Uh, first point is we are very active in the development of standards on several levels, uh, on um, ISO CEN, European, German, national level. And the second um, is in the Building Smart International Community, where we uh, work out and shape out, uh, or help shape out uh, new pre-standards. You all know the industry foundation class is coming from Building Smart International, and uh, further standards will come up. We uh, published a positioning paper about uh, ecosystems of digital twins last year. So if you want, you can download this from the uh, Building Smart International pages. And uh, the last uh, statement I would make here is we also uh, have to prove our own software against uh, being compliant with standards, with open web standards. And the last achievement we made here, we uh, earned this BIM Swarm German certification uh, saying our software is compliant with current BIM standards. So this was my five cents on this. Uh, hopefully in time I have to show the safe harbor statement at the, at the end for legal reasons. This is just saying if I'm talking nonsense here, please don't blame it on Oracle, just blame it on me. Uh, that's what it's saying. Uh, so thank you for uh, your attention. That's it. Over to you, Denise. Yeah, thank you very much for this 
short lecture for giving us these insights. Um, dear Ulrich, and um, yeah, you, as you just mentioned, BIM models are made for a purpose and um, yeah, your commitment to oh, these oh. Um, standards uh, belongs to the standards. So could you just briefly explain the meaning of these standards in a context for us? I mean, uh, it's uh, one side of the same matter. I'm making standards or helping make standards, which is quite an exciting uh, thing sometimes because there is sometimes a collision of interests and much uh, fighting for the best standard, best solutions. But there's also a, a famous saying from Werner von Siemens. He, he said, uh, uh, standards, who, who makes the standard is owning the market. It does mean there's a huge of uh, commercial interest. So uh, this is actually a, a market enabler. Standards are market enabler. And this is uh, true for if you travel through, through the UK, for example, you won't get your uh, charging uh, device into the wall outlet because it's different pins on your plug. So the same is with um, BIM standards. If um, information does not fit together, people cannot work. As uh, this uh, picture I showed uh, said, um, it's very important to have standard. That, that, that's where the excitement comes from, from my side, to enable the market. What do you think about the pace of action in Germany? Is it slow? Um, so where is Germany when it comes to BIM? Yeah, the pity is I'm, I'm looking always at the UK and um, I'm very, uh, let's say, jealous about how do they approach and how do they proceed. And we are uh, significantly significantly uh, lagging behind in Germany. That's a pity. We have this uh, nice step-by-step -step plan and still are on the step one uh, for years. So um, it's uh, necessary to uh, speed up to not lagging behind in the, in the international compared to what others do. Mm -hmm. um. I, I guess, or I just read in an article, you compared the digitization in the construction industry with the pandemic management. Um, so why do you set this and what do you think needs to be done? Yeah, that's an, uh, I mean, I express my personal opinion in this article. It's not uh, from my, uh, the company I'm working for. So uh, just to be careful on this, but I see some parallels um, in uh, the handling of the pandemic in Germany with uh, how we approach a BIM in Germany. Um, I mean, if you look at our healthcare system and, and the health authorities, how do they work in Germany, pen and pe paper and pencil and uh, phone calls, and this is not very digital to say the least. So if you look at our building authorities in Germany, you see the same things. Uh, they are under-equipped, they are under-trained, uh, they are underfunded, and uh, we are on one half uh, on this step-by-step -step plan and developing um, electronic uh, building permits. This is all done. Uh, I mean, the tech, there is no problem with technology. There's a problem with uh, administration and funding and making administration fit for them. Um, Ulrich, you just mentioned that you look to the UK when it comes to standards and BIM and the PACE. And uh, Ilka, Ilka is uh, with us today and th f till 2017 she worked there um, in the international engineering firm Arup for the UK. Is that right, Ilka? And maybe, um, yeah, I mean, uh, your, your topic is related to the statements from Ulrich. Um, you also say there's a lack of standards for BIM in existing buildings, in existing structures. And uh, you also meant that not everything that is possible makes sense. So would you explain that? And welcome Ilka Mai from LockLab Consulting. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Denise. Yes, so what I would like to talk about is um, now um, the BIM models for uh, existing assets, not only buildings, but also of assets. And Uli just mentioned the term digital twin. And in my experience, there seems to be a bit of a confusion between um, what is a BIM model and uh, what is a digital twin. Is it the same? Is it different? 
Um, if we could just look at the output of the BIM process, as Ernie just described it, it's an object-based 3D model representing an asset that doesn't exist yet, because usually BIM um, describes the design process of something that doesn't exist yet. If we think of a digital twin as um, an intelligent and uh, digital representation of an existing asset, um, which enables uh, mapping um, of objects to other data sources and optimizing processes, etc., then we see there is a big overlap in the sense that we're talking about uh, a digital representation that is object-based and that has a certain structure. And now a lot of people see that a digital twin not necessarily needs to have a spatial representation of the object. However, we in Rockleb, we believe that it adds a huge value if you do have a three-dimensional uh, digital twin. And therefore, a BIM model as the output of a design process and a digital twin as an output of a copy of an existing asset is it's actually quite similar. However, the way how we get there should be different. And that's also why I'm saying there are there is a lack of standards. Um, just picking up on a couple of things you mentioned earlier, Denise, especially sustainability and waste, etc. So when we look at existing assets and the challenges around existing assets, and we look at the asset managers, um, we see that they have a lot of problems and, and challenges around them. So very often they have to manage a large portfolio of assets. They could be all around the world, production sites, etc. And they are under immense pressure to save carbon and to save costs, looking at the whole life cycle of the asset. Um, they very often also have a historically grown uh, environment of IT systems and data systems and data. And that means that very often they can't really access the data quickly. They can't make good decisions based on good data quality. They don't know what the quality of the data is, is it outdated, etc. So lots of challenges around data. And when it comes to then uh, maybe refurbishing parts of, let's say, a railway station or something, then very often we want to start the new design in BIM and in 3D, but we're lacking the 3D data and, and the 3D model to do that. And that's why that all together creates a need for better information around existing assets. So um, when we now think of um, these models and the, and the data, I think we should agree that we need four ingredients and components which we really need to make this solution scalable and that technology um, really adding value. Um, so first of all, as we said, we need objects. Uh, just a point cloud or a mesh is not really adding value. Uh, usability in terms of file sizes, for example, runnability, how can I operate that, what do I need? Um, and and using, creating terabytes of data is also not helping. The next one is the valid business case. So if you make these copies, these digital twins, too expensive, then it won't fly because you won't have a good business case. And also, if you add another silo of information, that doesn't help. So you should look at the vision twin as a proper data integration solution. And if you put all these three four ingredients together, then I have a very strong case. Um, we can talk about laser scanners in this context a bit later. They produce highly accurate data, but not object-based. So therefore, it needs a bit of things processing after the data capturing. And um, a lot of people seem to struggle how to specify the output that they want to get out of the data capturing process. Um, and then when we talk about the, the, the model as an output of design process, the BIM model, um, then a lot of people now seem to get their head around how we use BIM in the design process, and then they try to apply the same method and the same standards for copying existing assets. That is not helpful. Um, it creates, it's too expensive, it's too uh, labor intensive, and it doesn't necessarily create a good result. So when you look at this old structure that we see here in the picture, um, when, and, and this is from a real case where um, a team was given a point cloud and asked to, to model this structure using a classic BIM tool. Um, and then they looked at the results and they found the results were not good because um, these retaining walls, they were quite um, deformed from age and, and from the pressure coming from one side. But a design tool will always assume that a wall is straight because we don't design dented and buckled and deformed walls normally. And there's a lot of problems that you can get into when you use the wrong tool, as Uli just mentioned, the wrong spoon to eat the soup, and it, it just doesn't work. Yes, but there are ways how we can produce 
these object-based models from just let's say moment photographs or videos and create object-based digital twins for the different purposes and different uses. And uh, as Uli said, uh, models are made for a purpose. To understand your purpose is really important. And then find out what the best way is to get there. And then you will have a valid business case at the end. That's my uh, short burst of introduction. Thank you. Wow. Um, at this point, I would also like uh, to um, address to the audience, if you have questions, please ask them in our chat because our experts, we will start with a panel discussion soon and our experts uh, will answer your questions. So if you have questions, post them in the chat. Um, Ilka, according to your com comments or just um, your, your statements or lecture you gave, um, BIM is not a general tool for planning in existing buildings. You also said um, um, the, the, uh, not, um, the, the design is not to rebuild um, the real um, uh, environment outside. So um, where, where are the limits of the method? I see it, it simply is the cost and the scalability. So if you think of the huge amount of existing assets that we operate, and they are sometimes they are very old, they are 100 years old or 50 years old, we are lacking the data of these assets to operate them more efficiently and to know how do we need to uh, look after them. When you then think of the design process, the design process needs highly educated and experienced people, as architects, as engineers, and they use very sophisticated tools for the design process. Now, there must be a better way of um, creating a good information model of an existing asset and not pretending that we were starting it from scratch in a design process. And that, that, that is not the, the right way to do it. So you, I think what we need to get better at is to uh, specify the quality of the output that, that people need to operate the assets um, and, and not use the design standards and the design tools to do that. So it's the scalability that is that's, um, that's putting the, the break in here. Okay, yeah. so BIM can do a lot of uh, in existing structures, existing areas, constructions. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when you just think of, um, you need to, you want to understand where information is to start with, and that is where a digital twin, as we showed it earlier, object-based um, 3D representation is a very intuitive way to understand how you get to information. What information do you want? So let's say you have, um, you're managing a building and you have a dashboard, and the dashboard contains lots of values of sensors and room, etc. And you see that as alarm is being triggered in one of the rooms, what you see is a long list of numbers, but you don't get the context. You don't know where that is. Where if you have a, a digital representation, a spatial representation, where you can see, oh, this alarm has been triggered in this room, so you can, in the virtual world, you can walk into the room, you can look inside, you can look what's in the, in the room next door, and you get the full context, and then you can make a much better decision. That's just one example, and there are hundreds. Interesting. So what do you think needs to happen to advance this use of BIM in uh, planning or in, or in, in, in these existing um, structures or buildings? To get better um, to understand the requirements and also then in the procurement process how to specify that when, um, when a company procures the data about the existing assets. Because at the moment a lot of companies are using the design standards procure data about existing assets. And that's why I'm saying this is too expensive and they're forcing us into a way of working which I don't think adds value. Um, so for example, um, you might have heard of LOD. LOD is now a term, level of development, how you specify the quality of information. And it's a term that's been developed for the design process because it specifies the maturity of a design. And you can specify it in terms of the geometry, the maturity, and the level of granularity for the, for the geometry, but also then for the information that is attached to the object. Um, whereas from an existing building, there is no level of maturity. That thing already exists there. So people need to get better at specifying the actual data that they want. What position accuracy do they need? Do they need to know um, by the millimeter where a switch is? Or that be just a centimeter off and it doesn't matter. 
Um, what granularity of objects do they need? What is the object breakdown structure? Do they need level one, level two? To which levels does it go down? Because what information do they want to have attached to the object? And that's where I see a big lack of um, expertise in understanding the actual data that people need to operate the asset better and then therefore start procuring exactly that information. At the moment, they're over-specifying and they're spending far too much money uh, on procuring the right data. Thank you very much, Ilka. Um, if anybody's interested to go deeper in that talk with Ilka, we can also ask your questions at any time. And we will right now uh, continue with our third guest, um, Emmanuel Di Giacomo. I'm very happy that you also found your way here in our, into our um, virtual roundtable of this Intergeo talk about BIM. Um, your statement is a kind of, I say, with digital methods, the Notre Dame Cathedral will be rebuilt in half the time as in the traditional way. And the effort pays off twice. Notre Dame may be equipped with sensor technology after the re reconstruction. So a similar event, that tragedy would unlike likely to happen again. That sounds very good. Please explain this to us and the stage is now yours. So as, as you were mentioning, uh, yes, we know that thanks to BIM, uh, we think that uh, we will be able to reconstruct Notre Dame faster than in a very traditional way. So I'm uh, working on this project together with a big team. And when the, when the cathedral took fire so in 2019, uh, we straight away uh, thought that uh, we would like to help. So first of all, we made a cash donation and we straight away got in touch with the organization, the public organization in charge of the reconstruction. And the President Macron wanted this to happen in a very fast and efficient way. And this is why he, he named uh, the general of the army uh, that you can see on the left, uh, the general charge. And one way also to, to help for us was to, we considered that uh, in terms of heritage, we would be able to help fasten the process using the, the BIM and uh, using pushing the limits of BIM actually to make this process more, more efficient. So we uh, worked together uh, with, uh, with some experts to, in order to create an existing model uh, before the fire of Notre Dame you have to be aware of the fact that Notre Dame uh, didn't have lots of documentation available, uh, which, is, uh, which is really a pity, actually. And the first step was uh, to go from uh, a scan to beam process, and this is what was achieved, you know, using this, as you can see it on the screen, uh, this kind of point cloud model. This is a view from the top, and uh, there were thousands, it represents 46,000 millions of pixels of, of, uh, of data. So there were both data coming from laser scanning uh, operations as well as the drones. Drones were used in, uh, in order to get uh, the, the aspects of the cathedral. So uh, part of this, uh, part of this uh, point clouds, by the way, uh, were uh, coming from uh, a previous uh, campaigns that was done with a famous uh, archaeology specialist called Andrew Talon. And as you can see from the top of the, this presentation, uh, we had to work with many point clouds uh, files. We had to clean them, to analyze them in order to see if there, there were any uh, problems on, on, on the, the existing model. And then we recreated a, a BIM model that you can see underneath. Uh, we chose, so Ilka was mentioning LOD, we chose to work on the LOD of 300. And here you can see uh, from the left to the right, so the, the, the point cloud survey. And then you can see uh, the point cloud with the, the B model of Notre Dame, uh, as, as well as the final uh, version of the, of the B model. Uh, as you can see, it resulted in a, in a very high fidelity model, fully designed in, in, in Revit, obviously. And this was very important because uh, all the people, all the com companies that are involved in the reconstruction process of Notre Dame didn't have any material in order to 
to plan uh, different uh, various aspects of the future reconstruction of Notre Dame. And also you have to take into account the fact that for almost one year since last year, there was all the scaffolding on top of Notre Dame, which was melted. So there were many operations before that had to be processed in order to remove, for example, for example the, the scaffoldings, and there were some security operations uh, around Notre Dame. Uh, also, we not only we modeled Notre Dame itself as a as a as a cathedral, but we remodeled as well the the presbyter the presbytery sorry, uh, also the crypt and all the surroundings of Notre Dame to be able to uh, facilitate the future uh, operations and logistics on the sites. And this is where also beam is uh, beam is very important. Uh, this is um, a, a version of the, the resulting uh, B model, which is more of a structural model. We have an accuracy, Luca was speaking about accuracy. We know that we have an accuracy of between one to four sentiment, uh, centimeter, which is based on the point cloud, uh, of course. And thanks to that, and again, we are talking about the importance of data, thanks to that, all the reconstruction team is able to evaluate for example, the, the number of uh, cube, cube meters of stone walls or the, the zinc roofing, uh, the number of vaults uh, on such a very complex, and this is where the challenge is because on a typical building, uh, modern building, it's not a very big challenge, you know, to model a uh, modern building with such a monument, an historical monument, it's very difficult because here we have 186 vaults which are all different. Uh, and uh, why did we, cho did we choose uh, out of the fact that we are convinced that BIM is important for, and BIM is digital and digital are important for the construction industry? We are also convinced that it brings value to, uh, to the multiple reconstruction teams that work on site because it's about 250 uh, companies that are working on site. So here, uh, sorry, normally there is an animation, but Yes, sorry, just going here. Uh, we know that it will help in the various phases of reconstruction. Uh, for example, we know that our technology could help in order to explain the complex structural geometry to the various trades that are involved on site. It would help. Uh, it could help to extract any kind of 2D documentation or the production of this documentation. We will be able also to reconstruct, uh, to, to, to define the reconstruction planning and phasing. Eventually, the, the architects in charge of the historical monuments could also eventually design the roofing of Notre Dame. And also a very important part of this, uh, of this reconstruction process is around the systems routing, because obviously everything has burned, so they will have to redesign everything. And it will help in the security aspects also on site for the workers and staff security, uh, obviously. Uh, at the end of the day, as it's a very complex process and as the French president defined that it should be rebuilt in five years, we know that thanks to BIM, this could definitely help. Uh, as also Ilka was mentioning, it's very important to uh, define the business cases and the use case if you are able to at least uh, uh, reach uh, two or three or four objectives. I mean, uh, you will you will be sure that you will have a good return on investment. And in that case, we we define together with the reconstruction team that we will be using BIM for the reconstruction planning and phasing, which is about the fourth dimension, about which is about time, and the fifth dimension, which is about m managing quantities, kind of information also. It will be very helpful also for the site installation and logistics management in order to be sure that everything like cranes will be positioned correctly, uh, that we will be able to bring the materials, the trucks, etc., at the right place on the site. And finally, very important, will be, we want to make sure that the collaboration between all the thousands of stakeholders will be uh, efficient with a, a collaboration platform like BIM360 that you can see uh, on this uh, screen. And also, we speak a lot about collaboration nowadays, especially with, uh, with BIM. 
the collaboration is really critical to the success and time savings, and the time savings are the key in this kinds of, uh, of huge construction sites. So, um, in uh, as a conclusion, I would say that here in that case, which is a very specific case, uh, BIM will help to build faster, better, with less resources, obviously, and it will help protect our heritage in the future. And I would terminate also with, uh, uh, so Ilkan Ulrich mentioned uh, the importance of digital uh, twins, which, which we definitely agree uh, upon. And we are definitely um, convinced, together with the owners of Notre Dame, that having a digital twin model of the cathedral with the right information, the right level of detail, right level of information connected with IoT sensors, will help in the future to correctly operate and maintain these kinds of monuments and avoid uh, disasters like the one that this cathedral has been uh, suffering from. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this presentation of a project that has made waves all over the world. Um, I mean, everybody uh, remembers the pictures in the news or the social medias from Notre Dame Cathedral when it was burning and burned down. So um, thank you very much for these insights in the construction and the building and um, yeah you you decided uh, with with the, your, your team with your know-how to to recapture the the cathedral so why did you decide to to recapture it uh, because first of all first of all as i was mentioning there was no documentation available at that time yeah. and together with the the team in charge of the reconstruction of notre dame we really had to analyze the differences uh, before the fire and after the fire, first of all, in order to understand if there were any disasters, the cathedral that had maybe moved, etc. And then after, we thought straight away about the roofing system and the carpentry, and we had uh, to think about and brainstorm around the possible redesign of the roofing. And you know that there, there have been lots of discussions also around the world. So we had to have something concrete, a 3D model with information, which would have uh, helped to, to, to take better decisions and not make any mistake uh, in the reconstruction of Notre Dame. So this was obvious that BIM was the right approach. Okay, so but right now you have much better tools. Uh, just describe once again your tools you you use right now. Uh, so the tools that are, that are currently being used on Notre Dame. So first of all, uh, for all the point clouds, there is Recap, Autodesk Recap, which is a software which allows you to uh, to to load and merge different point clouds coming from different sources like. Uh, drones or laser scanning, etc., which allows you to do some analysis. Uh, Revit has been mainly used for the remodeling of the cathedral. So Revit is one of the uh, most famous software in the world, BIM software in the world. It's a pluridisciplinary tool. And we are uh, at, the, at the core of the collaboration process. There is BIM 360, our collaboration platform. And we've been also making some tests with our uh, digital twin solution uh, called uh, Tandem. Thank you very much for the, explaining these BIM methods to me. And uh, also the question to our audience, about 80 or 90 um, participants are with us. Do you have questions um, to Emmanuel um, about uh, the reconstruction of the Notre Dame Cathedral or to concerning the BIM methods used? Um, just ask them right now in the chat and we will answer them right now. So right now, um, I would like to continue with the panel, the whole panel with Ulrich Hartmann, Ilka May, and of course, Emmanuel Di Giacomo. Um, yeah, um, we, we just heard about the BIM methods and uh, well, just one more question. Um, to Emmanuel. Um, so the reconstruction of the Notre Dame Cathedral is an absolutely extraordinary, I mean, once in a lifetime project, is it? <laughs> yes, because as you know, uh, Notre Dame was born something like uh, hundreds of, of, of centuries before, you know, so it's a very, 
it has taken lots of hundreds of, of years, you know, to build this cathedral. And it's uh, it's one of the hugest cathedral in the world. It's an iconic monument, and it's amazing to be working on this on this monument and to be using mod modern uh, and innovative methods of construction and in that case reconstruction so we are very honored that it's a challenge for us which also helps us you know uh, to bring some evolutions to our technologies of course because this is totally different from using beam technology to uh, with uh, with modern buildings Eka Ulrich do you have any questions to um, Emmanuel or in the other way or should we just start with our um, all together discussion right now shaking your hand mean, perfect so yeah uh, yes, yeah, well, uh, but immediately comes to my mind is uh, Notre Dame is a landmark object, project, whatever. Um, and you mentioned, Emmanuel, there's nothing you know about this uh, in terms of how it's been constructed, the material inside and so. And isn't it that we have uh, many, many small Notre Dames in our uh, cities, so we actually do not know what has been built in. Um, that's a uh, it's a, yeah, if we look at the Grenfell event, for example, we even do not know about dangers or in, in the materials we uh, have built in. So what do you think? It's, I mean, Ilka mentioned it's a, a huge effort to uh, digitalize each and everything. So that's not the way we can do it. But uh, how do you think we can proceed, proceed in this regard? I think that, so you are right, and there is not a single receipt, you know, uh, to understand how to uh, to collect all the information, which is very different because uh, we, we realize with this kind of project that any kind of information is important. Uh, a, a piece of paper, uh, some photographies, and there, has, there has been in the context of Notre Dame, uh, so it was not managed by us, but there has been a, a huge campaign of uh, retrieving all the different kind of information that were available, and most of them were around photographies, by the National Center of Research, Scientific Research in France, CNRS. And one of the big work for them was to, to collect all this kind of information to store it in a specific database. So they've been working, they have a specific uh, application that they developed. It's a national solution called IOLI. And this was a huge and a big part of the process was to collect in order to understand how it was built, uh, with which materials, how it had evolved in, in the in the past, etc. And this was very important uh, for the also for the, the success of the future reconstruction. Um, Jan Hoffmann has a question. Which software do you recommend for modeling BIM existing buildings? As a, which, which software do you recommend? Maybe the question first to Ulrich Hartmann. To me, you mean. Uh, which software? I, I have a recommendation, for sure, and that's a common data environment to, to share all this information correctly in, in a efficient and um, uh, efficient way. I mean, it's taking off all those informations you mentioned, Emmanuel, by laser scanning and so on, creating then BIM models from that, but you have to share some uh, information between all those disciplines. In your case, you say uh, BIM 360, your tool is uh, the, the most advanced, and uh, of course there are others like or Econix CD could do that. Emmanuel, the question is up so to you. Which software about... uh, do you recommend for um, the uh, existing buildings? Uh, it's a good question. Actually, it can be a mix of different software because we, we realize that in some specific cases, let's take the example of a statue which is on, on a, a cathedral, uh, we, we, we see that by experience. And we work with, a, uh, for example, a French company, which is a, a long experience company, because it's, they've been working in that field for more than 25 years. And they use a, a collection of different software. So they use Revit mainly, and they use also 3ds max they they use sometimes rhino also for some specific complex shapes that you cannot model with a traditional beam software 
it's interesting also to see that CAD is still uh, very important because 2D documentation is a, a very big part of the process. So it would be a combination also of using the AutoCAD as a tool. And we were mentioning point clouds. So for point clouds, you would use either the software coming from directly from uh, Leica laser scanning system or Faro or Topcon or whatever, or Trimble once. But you then after, in order to uh, treat and analyze the information, you could definitely use software like uh, Autodesk Recap, etc. So there is not uh, one single answer. It's always a mix and a, a smart way of using different kinds of tools. And as Ulrich mentioned that as well, there are different kinds of C CDs when you want to um, share the information and uh, transform it transform it into a digital twin, you can also uh, make uh, different choices. Ilka, do you also have a recommendation? Because then each of you has the chance to give a recommendation for the construction software using for existing buildings. I don't think that in that context we should promote any particular vendor or uh, software. Um, I agree that we should look at the requirement and then pick the appropriate tool that gives us the best results. Okay. Um, then yeah, that's for case, sure, I can only say we're using algorithms. We are not using a particular software. We're using AI and we're using algorithms to produce exactly whatever describes the best output or whatever is needed. Okay. And maybe one remark from my side, uh, Denise, if I may, uh, and that is uh, that I mentioned models are made for a purpose. And if you take off uh, an existing building, for what reason do you do that? for reconstruction or for reusing material or what is the reason and uh, the reason determines uh, the, the right tool and not uh, start with a tool and then do what you can do with the tool it's uh, for checking the requirements by what is the intended need for this information you take off well, let's go a bit back to the beginning when I mentioned the huge potential for um, climate, environment, the potentials. Um, yeah, what social significance do you as experts attach to this um, topic? Um, yeah, just give examples. I can say something to that if I may. So Uli said um, he's a big fan of the UK approach. And um, I think they put a very um, good um, vision out for that and it was very simple it says building assets better building better assets and um think about that for a second so just do what you do do it in a better way using better tools being more collaborative etc so that is about the design process but the other one is about building better assets that's not better in the sense of the right assets in the right place so how do we know what we need and that comes back to that question we as the society and as members of society, we consume services, like we get on trains and buses, we get treated in hospitals, we go to universities, etc. And all these services are provided on the back of the built environment. So what, where do we need the next railway to go? How many hospitals do we need? Where do we need the hospital to be? How big do we need it? So that's all the questions which eventually then the construction sector will design and build the thing but we as a society, we determine where it's needed. And that's where I think we should look at where feedback loop from how people consume assets is really important. And that's where we should stop looking at the micro micro level of just saving a few quid uh, in the design process, but also start looking at the bigger picture. So what's the embedded carbon really? And how this building, which was designed for a certain purpose and for a certain energy consumption, how is that delivering to the expectation? Is it actually really only consuming that, or is it consuming a lot more? So where is then the, the, the fault? Was it in the design, or was it in construction, in the materials, or was it just a, a lie from the start? Anything else to add, for examples, yes. uh, for the potentials? Uh, potential is huge uh, in any phase of the project. So we've been talking about the, the design phase and, and the, mainly in the construction and operation phase and it's obvious that without digital uh, digital approaches and beam it's uh, it's difficult to uh, to reach the the targets that have been uh, defined by the european union for example 
you know, there is also this uh, big renovation wave uh, at European level. And if we want to massify, uh, so and if you want to reach these goals of having better buildings, uh, being able to, uh, to manage the energy that they will be consuming, making them better in terms of efficiency, etc. If you want to massify, because we realize that in each country we have a, we have a, a big, um, uh, I mean, uh, we have a big database of, of existing buildings that we will have to renovate. We, we, can't, we can't imagine that we will destroy them all, etc. And if we want to massify and to reach as soon as possible these targets, we definitely use. Um, uh, we definitely need to uh, to base the, our strategy on digital technologies, on drones or whatever. I mean, BIM is a kind of it's an epiphenomenon. It's only one part of the solution. You have so many. Uh, I mean, Ilka was speaking about AI, about the generative design, and all these kinds of things. We have to. Uh, grab all what is available in terms of innovation in order to reach all these goals. We cannot imagine, when I hear sometimes, and Ulrich was mentioning uh, the beam adoption in Germany, we have the same issue in France. How can we imagine, how can public authorities imagine that they will reach the targets that have been defined at national level or international level without basing their strategy on digital technologies and beam? It's impossible. So, it's very important at Autodesk. We think that it's very important because we apply this to ourselves, first of all. So we would like, uh, I mean, all the uh, public owners, etc., all the governments to take this seriously into account and to use all what is possible in terms of resources to make this happen faster. Ulrich, you just saw the question, a question especially to you. Um, what are the limits of the data processing for large buildings, such as roads, railways, or power lines? Yeah, I mean, that's a typical question. Um, in terms of megabytes or gigabytes, there's virtually no limit. But um, um, in terms of how could we understand these data and uh, um, data mining in, in those cases, uh, it's um, as I, I just can, can come back to the uh, phrase models are made for a purpose and this is not uh, that should be the driving force to uh, limit the information inside the model to the absolute minimum and then you never reach these uh, limits in terms of gigabytes it's more about uh, having the right decisions on the right data so um, uh, technically I would say there is no limit Eka? I have a question to Emmanuel, actually, because what we observe here in Germany now is that a lot of clients, especially um, in the public sector, they want us to uh, produce a BIM model from an existing asset in a proprietary software so that it can then be handed over to an architect or an engineering firm for the next phase of a refurbishment or conversion or, or rebuilding or something like that. Is that also something that you see happening in France? Because I see the limits here that if we did that, if we would produce a full um, copy of an existing asset, there's still, as you said earlier about the rental, there's still a whole lot we don't know about this building. We can't see. We can't see inside. We can't always see what is behind the cladding or something like that. Um, we, we can still produce uh, a geometry of what we can see, and we can make some assumptions, but there's limits to that. So in Germany now, the, the, the process, what the client would like to see is that they then give this model to an architect and the architect takes it, puts it into his, his design software and starts editing on that basis. And I don't think that this is going to happen because they would adopt a lot of liability and risk if they did that. So they would, I see that they would always only use it as a reference, as a background reference, and then start their own new model on, on a new design. I would be very keen to hear how that is in France. Do you see a similar tendency to do that? And do you see similar limitations? Or is it just Germany being over-anxious? No, I think so. so uh, yes, Ilka. So it's kind of similar in France. Uh, maybe the difference is that uh, we have uh, companies that specialize only in scan to beam 
producing models specific specifically for owners. So generally, so most of the time, these models would be produced to nurture an operation and maintenance system. Uh, they would not ask the architects because, first of all, uh, this is not so. Architects don't like these kinds of, uh, I would say, missions. There, I, I agree with you that there are lots. There are many uh, limitations in this kind of approach. Uh, generally, the owners are requiring uh, IFC model. We see lots of limitation uh, also due to the fact that, uh, as you said, there are so many things that we are not able to see, you know, underneath all the systems, etc. which means uh, that we have to have a specific strategy. Sometimes we, we must break um, specific elements in the, I mean, in the, in the buildings, etc. So there, there has to be a, a strategy around that. but. Generally, uh, we have some specific companies which are specialized in that, and most of the time they partner with, with companies like software developers specialized in operation and maintenance in order to define the right, lev right level of detail, whether it's uh, geometrical or the information that you want to have access to, if you want uh, the operation and maintenance system to be efficient enough uh, to give some good data back to the owner afterwards. But it's it's a real issue. Well, here's an idea, because Oli mentioned how exciting it is to create standards. So what we might need for existing assets, we might not need a level of maturity standard. We might need a level of reliability. So there are some things that I know for sure, 100% fact. And there are things where I've made it an assumption on the basis of something, and then I can pass that information on to someone else. Yes, well, that would right. be a good net new standard to do, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, it would be. I fully agree with you. But you know, one also of the big concern is that in the case that you were mentioning, we are lucky because maybe the owner is uh, is asking for a BIM model or is asking the uh, the architect to produce a BIM model. There are also lots of cases where there is only paper drawing. And then it's even even more challenging. And this is where we see also startup companies creating some specific algorithms which allow to recreate, I would say, a basic BIM model, you know, uh, based uh, using uh, blueprints and recreating IFC BIM models then, that then after are reused for operation and maintenance proper purposes. So um, we just saw that there are a lot of questions and right now we try to share um, the chat window with all of you because there are special questions to the three of you, to Ilka, to Ulrich Hartmann, but also to um, um, all of them. Um, so please give me the whole chat that we can read that together. Maybe we start at the bottom. Ilka, are there already examples of databases that hold BIM data as part of them for lots of buildings, e.g. cities of the UK? Um, if so, we would have a good database for comparing Notre Dame with Cologne Cathedral, for example, or one office building with another in the same city. Who could hold those databases? Ilka, <laughs> might. Yeah, yeah. That links to the question uh, above from Pauline about the algorithms behind that and what, what, what role does AI play. I can only speak for ourselves. So we have created over time an enormous database of uh, objects from the real world. And that's the difference. So our uh, database contains all sorts of windows and everything that we've extracted from videos or photographs from the real world. And they look like real world objects. So therefore, they're different from design tools, which are generic representations of something that doesn't exist or have been just um, extracted from that. Um, so and the AI, the, the algorithms, and the, the artificial intelligence gets trained to detect and identify objects in a video or in a point cloud or in a photography and replace it with the object from our library. And that's how we produce object-based models from existing stuff. Um, I hope that answers this question. Um, who can hold those databases? Well, that's where it comes to politics. Um, this is a huge market for innovation and for um, competition and um, for dr driving better outcomes through a very good strategy where politics and politicians can create um, 
and incentivize a very competitive and innovative market by getting this right. So uh, why not uh, Lockland holds a database like that? There might be hundreds of other companies holding databases. And that's a healthy competition. And that's something where I think uh, we don't need one central database that is owned by everyone. That's, I think, where we need competition. Thank you. There's another question. Is it possible to scan infrastructural services such as underground, electromechanical pipes, cables, etc.? Yes, it is possible. It, al it already happened. There were lots of proof of concept in the US. I remember an example, for example, in, uh, in Las Vegas. And we see also, I'm sure in the UK, that it's already the case. Uh, because there are already uh, some uh, startup companies in the UK uh, making small robots that are able to go in the different kind of, uh, of system networks, you know, under the streets, etc. And in France, we, saw, we, we see also many examples of uh, companies being able to produce these kinds of uh, infrastructure information. Okay, do you agree? Your, your radar springs to mind at the way of uh, examine the, the underground without penetrating it physically. Yeah. Um, perfect. I think all in all we had the huge topics. There was another for the cathedral. I guess we didn't answer yet. How how um, how did you benefit from the BIM model um, in the facility management? for operation, but the facility management will start in a few years, or? Yes, it's, uh, it's, a good, it's a good point. I saw the question. So actually, we are not in this in this phase yet. Yet, We are discussing with the diocese, uh, which is the organization, which is the owner, actually, and they are interested in this topic. It has not been defined yet, although they see lots of uh, benefits and added value that they could get from uh, having a BIM model for the operation and maintenance phase. But this has not been defined yet, obviously, because uh, for the moment, the, I mean, the, the, uh, the very the strategic part is the reconstruction of Notre Dame. Okay. Um, I have another question. We heard a lot about the potential and um, maybe it's also um, yeah, time to come to an end. But there's one question I have um, to all of you um, when we're talking about the potential. And uh, again, in your words, where are we right now and what could be in a few years or in a short period of time? Well, if I may start. Um, hard to say, but we are uh, still on, at the beginning, I would say. And it's uh, a permanent journey. So as, as you can see, the digital twin story is a very exciting one. And if you look at the uh, things uh, done in the UK already, they are at, um, at on the journey already uh, with their uh, center of digital with Britain. They are already putting in real data from existing um, urban take off into a huge database in the National Archive. So that's what the uh, things will go, I think, to include and integrate everything. Ilka, what do you think about that question? Where are we today with BIM? And what about the potentials? Uh, I think there's still lots of misunderstandings around BIM. And uh, we're, still, we're still seeing to create costs rather than uh, generating value from the whole process. So I hope that we will very soon be uh, through that phase where we then start to really realize that uh, we can make things uh, more efficient, simpler, slicker. At the moment, every BIM, process, uh, BIM, BIM project that I see um, seems to drive people absolutely mad because they think, oh my God, this is all so complicated and why can't we do it as we did it before? And it should be the other way around. It should be like, oh, I never want to go back to how we did it before because this is so much better. And there's only one project that I've worked on and this was in the UK where this was the case where people after a few weeks said, oh, absolutely brilliant. Um, but that requires a lot of um, 
very educated client, uh, lots of processes, so not just looking up how do we model things on the software do we use, but really it's the whole collaboration process that Uli mentioned earlier. And if we then start to collaborate and work together, all adhering to the same structures and processes, etc., then it becomes so simple and, and really, really valuable. Thank you. Ulrich Hartmann, uh, last e round e up e to e you. E e e e if I may add maybe to what Silke and Ulrich uh, just said, I think that the big challenge is that the AEC industry, uh, especially in Europe, is very fragmented. We have lots of uh, SMBs and VSBs, very small business companies and small and medium business. Uh, if you would draw a curve you know, about the adoption uh, of BIM, you would see that you have the, the major uh, companies, the big companies, which are on the top of the curve. They have no problems because they have resources, they have a strategy, they have very talented people, etc. But if you look at the VSBs and the SMBs, they are, they are really at the bottom of the curve. And, and the problem is that this curve is kind of uh, amplifying over the years. And we should definitely not leave anyone on the side of the road because uh, there is a, a risk of big disruption for all the, the small companies and medium companies. And if we want BIM and digital approaches to be successful, we have to have everyone, you know, together, working together, collaborating together. If not, it will be as, uh, it will not be succeeding. And we see also in the UK that although they are leading the way in Europe, they, they ask to themselves this critical question of how should we do uh, to um, bring all the AEC ecosystem to get together on the road of success. And this partially depends on the on the desire of governments, on the on the resources that they put, on the money that they put on the table, and we have to work all to, together in that and not forget anyone. And this, in my opinion, uh, this is what is uh, more important actually. Thank you very much. Um, I just had a look on my watch, and we are talking right now for eighty minutes. Um, yeah, uh, time is flying, uh, but um, I would suggest um, that we will meet in uh, September at Intergeo Hybrid. Um, you can participate digital or in Hanover at the um, Expo, Hanover Expo. And there will also be a huge topic in the conference and of course in the Expo with all the companies and their solutions. And uh, I guess because we have so many more questions, we hadn't time to talk about um, how integrate BIM when uh, talking about citizen participation and so on. So there are some more few topics um, that just had not space in that short hour of the Intergeo talk format. So I would like to say an official thank you very much for joining us and say goodbye until September or until our next Intergeo TV talk, which will then be at the 18th of June about Smart City. And um, thank you very much. And uh, if you like, you can also stay right now um, also in the chat, ask some more questions um, if this is helpful. But um, thank you very much, Ilka Mai from LockLab Consulting, Emanuel Di Giacomo from Autodesk, and Ulrich Hartmann from Oracle. It was a pleasure, and I hope to see you soon. <laughs>